Hey, everybody. I'm Matthew Coker. I'm going to be talking about Ruby on Rails CI on EC2. A little bit of Rails. Mostly, it's just about CI on EC2. Uh, so if that's what you're here for, you're in the right place. Um, I'm a, sorry, I've got a, I'm used to walking around the stage, but I've got to stand here. So I will do my best. If I wander away from the mic, please shoot me back this way. I'm a developer at Pivotal Labs. I've been at Pivotal Labs for about three years now. Um, how many of you have heard of Pivotal Tracker? How many of you have used it? Most of you, okay. Some with some su success and some without. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is we're also a consultancy. So Pivotal Tracker came out of our work working with a lot of different clients. And the one thing that we do is we have generally have 30 to 40 different projects in our offices at any given time. And most of those projects only last three to six months. And so we have a lot of projects that come in. And pretty much one of the few things that we do on all of our projects is test all the time. We, um, we, have, we do agile methodologies. We do rapid iterations. We do project planning. Uh, we do pair programming, but one of our, the, perhaps the core practice we have is testing. And so a project that comes in, if it has zero tests on day one, it will have more than that by the end of the week. It'll have 100 by the end of the week. And we want to have CI set up within the first day or two. We don't want to spend weeks waiting for a CI instance to come online. We don't want to wait for somebody to set it up. We just want to have CI going. So we've gone through over the years, um, sorry, uh, jumping ahead of myself. Uh, because we're testing all the time, we are testing whatever we're going to use. And so if we're going to use Redis, Memcache, React, Mongo, whatever crazy dependency, we're actually going to test that as well. We're not going to stub it out, which means that our CI environments need to be dynamic. They need to be something that a developer can go and add the dependencies that they need. They don't want to go and ask somebody to go and configure it on the box. They need to just be able to go and do it. Um, so I want to give you an overview of sort of how our CI infrastructure has evolved over the course of time. Uh, we've been around for many years um, before I started. Uh, we've had different sort of incantations of CI. This is sort of the last three years or so of where we've, I guess it's four or five years actually, of where we've been. We started off sort of where I think a lot of people start off is just one box that runs all your tests. Um, you start a second project, you know, you break out something and you add that on as another build to this on this one machine. And then that gets a little slow, so you buy a bigger machine and you put more builds on it. The problem that this brings up is that you now have multiple teams that care about this one box being up, which isn't ever a good idea, frankly. Um, one team, one, multiple boxes. You don't want to have teams sharing boxes. It's just like deploying to production. You don't want to have multiple people deploying to the same thing. When the, build, when the build box gets wedged for some reason, everybody points their fingers at the other person and nobody does anything about it. So this sort of, we outgrew this as, I don't know, probably past the 10 project mark. It just didn't work anymore. So there were all sorts of soul searching discussions. And what we settled on was a Mac mini farm. We had, a stack of, we had a stack of Mac minis that was about yay high if you stacked them all on top of each other. We tended to spread them out for earthquake reasons, but other than that, like it, we, we enjoyed it. Um, this was good from a separation of concerns. Each project, when they started, got handed a Mac mini. When the client left, we handed them the Mac mini. There were all sorts of accounting problems because we couldn't figure out if we needed to charge sales tax when we build them for the Mac mini, which nobody ever wanted to deal with. Um, and there was also sort of this sort of at the end of the thing of taking the CI box and then they'd wrap the power cord around it and they'd take it back to their office and they'd set it on a shelf. They rarely plugged it in, it seemed like. You'd get a call three months later. We're trying to set up the CI box. And so this worked. Um, there were some real positives about this. A Mac mini is very close to our development environment, which meant that just about anybody can log into a Mac mini and figure out how to make their tests run. Um, there's something to be said for this. Uh, we've gone ahead and given that convenience up, but it's, it's something that we sort of missed from time to time. Um, just taking a development box, making it run your tests all the time was sort of what C where CI came out of. It's just this neutral third development, third party development box. Um, so as we've moved on from this, we've sort of lost that. We've gained other things. 
but there are some real positives there. Uh, we did, however, want to move away from the Mac Mini farm and sort of get to something that was scalable so that we could start a new project, not have to worry about any hardware, and just start it day one, get going. So, of course, the answer to every problem like this these days is to the cloud. This was about a year and a half ago. Uh, we really had, there was a mandate basically to stop buying hardware, get this stuff off the books, get it somewhere where it was easy for anybody to get started. So what we came up with at this time was Lobot. Lobot is a name for our gem that we use for configuring CI. It's a collection of a lot of different things. That the goal is that a project can get an EC2 account. We create a new EC2 account for each project, and they get that in their email, and about an hour later, they can have a CI box on EC2 running their tests. Um, it shouldn't take all of the hour these days, but we try and budget a full hour just because it, it's better to under, or under promise and over deliver. So what does it actually take to get CI on EC2? Just out of curiosity, how many of you have used EC2? How long did it take? Did most of you get your first server set up within the first hour? Some of you. Uh, there's a lot that actually goes into getting a server actually spun up on EC2. They've made it easier these days, but it's not, there are a lot of sort of caveats that you have to figure out, work through, and when we have 30 different projects going through this, we don't want each one of them to go through and rediscover each one of these. So the question, so what it actually does when you start interacting with EC2 is that it manages your SSH keys on AWS. So as soon as you say, start me a server, it goes and looks, do you have any SSH keys? Puts your current SSH key onto AWS so that when you boot up the box, it's already there. It manages your security group. So by default, when you spin up a box on EC2, you'll find that you can't do anything with it because you can't even get to it. Um, what you've got to do is go into this, the security groups, which are much like a firewall, and open up the given ports that you need. You don't want to open up all of them. You want to open up the right ones that you need that are secure well, uh, so, you, but, so you can access it. The other thing it does is actually launch the AWS instance. It has an AMI ID hard-coded in it. It has uh, instance size hard-coded in it. Well, you can modify it, but it comes with defaults so that, you can so that you don't have to think about which type of box am I setting up. You just say, I want a CI box, a start server, and off it goes. After you've sort of gotten this server, the rake task, it's actually a rake task that starts the server. It comes back, and now you've got a server running that you can SSH into. But you can't really do much with a server that you can SSH into. It's not running anything that you really care about. So the first sort of step we have in the world is upload a bootstrap script and run it. Um, this is sort of the same process you'll recognize if you've ever deployed a production server. You sort of end up with these sort of two steps. Um, but we wanted to make it easy, wanted to make it automated, wanted to have defaults so that no one had to go through this every time. So the bootstrap script installs Ruby dependencies, and then it installs RVM. So this is basically, uh, currently it's an apt-get install bunch of packages, and then it installs RVM, which is, for those of you who aren't in the Ruby world, RVM is Ruby version manager, which is how we manage multiple versions of Ruby. We also use, we use Ruby to run Chef, and so that's the one thing we need on the box before we can actually start configuring it. So we go through the bootstrap script, that takes less than five minutes these days. And at the end of that, you're ready to start running your Chef recipes. Have, how many of you have used Chef in the audience? A couple? Not too many. Chef, you're probably familiar with, is an automated configuration management tool. Um, we use Chef Solo. There's this whole body of work that is Chef Server, which is a lot of complexity that you don't need for managing a couple boxes. Um, Chef Server, um, there are hosted versions. There are, uh, you can install it on your site. You've got to install all these various dependencies, CouchDB, Erlang, whatever these days. Um, Chef Solo just requires Ruby on the box. So we upload the recipes to the box, and we start installing the things that you're going to need for a CI environment. So we install Postgres or MySQL. We install Qt for Capybara WebKit, which is for headless Selenium testing. We install Nginx. Um, this is actually one of those complicated, one of the sort of important things that we do for a team that's setting up a CI box, because sort of the temptation is to just open up port 8080 and start hitting Jenkins. 
um, which if you're hosting this in a public location is not a great idea. Um, we don't want to think about Jenkins security. We trust that they're doing their best to keep it secure, but we don't, we trust Nginx, basic auth and SSL a lot more. So we just set up Nginx, we set basic auth up and we set SSL up. Uh, we use a self-signed certificate, so you get a certificate warning, which is good enough for us because it keeps the, keeps the information safe. Uh, we also install Node for the asset pipeline, and last but not least, we install Jenkins. So this, at this point, you pretty much have a box that works. Uh, we got this going a while ago, and we sort of, at that point, we said, well, let's polish this. Let's give people more than what they'd get if they got by hand. So we started um, adding some tools that we, from the Ruby community into the build. CI Reporter is a gem that spits out the XML that Jenkins expects for, uh, for tests. Um, if you're doing Ruby work, I highly recommend you just drop it in. It's pretty pain, it's just about as painless as can be to drop it in, but it lets you click around through the build and see, you know, see what tests are red, see what tests are green. You can get nice graphs of how many tests you have. Um, you can you know, see which, which ones have been failing, how long they've been failing for. It's a really small change and it's a really big win to improve how you interact with CI. Headless is a gem that actually fires up XVFB and gives you a virtual frame buffer um, for a given Ruby block of code. There are Jenkins plugins that do this too, so it's more of an idea than something, you, you don't have to use Headless, you can use the Jenkins plugins. Um, we're a Ruby shop, we're pretty comfortable with Ruby, so we just throw in Headless because anybody can go and read through it pretty quickly. But it's a really useful tool for when you want to actually run Selenium tests. And it's nice to just give it to people without them having to think about it, without having to know, without having to know what they need to go look for, without having to choose a solution. They just have it there and it works. And we also uh, put into your project, as soon as you run install Lobot, the CI build script. So most of you are probably, since you're here at the Jenkins user conference, familiar with the idea of not putting your build script into that box that Jenkins gives you. So Jenkins gives you this box that you can drag and make it as big as you want to write your CI build script. And all you ever want to do there is call a shell script. Um, for troubleshooting, you might paste that build script back into that box sometime. But for your day-to-day -day use, you want to put that in the repo so that it's actually documented with the code. The challenge is that those CI build scripts are actually not trivial to come up with. Um, it's not something you want to organically come to at least for your first iteration every time because there are lots of sort of egg chicken problems about if databases are created or if gems are installed before you try and shell or before you try and use them. Um, so it's nice to just have one that sort of does everything that people have used, but put it in the project so that when your project changes, you can modify it. So now we have people who have CI set up on EC2. They've got one green build and they have one or two tests um, if it's a brand new project. And at this point, they're thinking CI is awesome because their build takes about 10 seconds to run, which is great. It's exciting. You know, you check in a failing test and it comes back immediately red. Your, your CC menu in your corner of your taskbar goes red or your project monitor display in the office goes red. And it's awesome. As time goes on, we've probably all sort of experienced this as a project gets older. For us, it's probably about three months in. Uh, tests are getting a little slower. You've written more tests. You're up to a couple hundred, maybe thousand, probably less than 2,000, depending on how fast you're writing tests. CI is pretty good, but it's getting slower. And you're getting a couple random failures, usually, on most projects I've seen. And by the time you're six months to a year in of really doing test-driven development, people are starting to hate CI. Um, they're sort of, it's become this redheaded stepchild that they want to ignore. It's become, it's no longer giving them useful feedback. It's giving them feedback about how bad they were at writing tests. Um, it's telling them that they couldn't deal with race conditions in their tests instead of actually telling them what they've, what they've failed at that day, which is really what you want it to be about. Um, so. I have a few tips for people who are sort of going through this, um, either at the beginning or at the end. Um, the first thing I tell people is to start with Parallel Test. Um, parallel Test is a Ruby gem. There are plenty of other things, I'm sure, for all the other communities out there, um, which Parallel Test actually takes your test suite up, divides it into 
uh, n blocks for the number of cores that you have and runs, runs them all in parallel. This is great because it speeds up your test build, which you don't need when you're first starting out. But you do want this because it causes you to deal with inner test dependencies a lot faster. If you want to go and parallelize your test suite uh, six months or a year or two months into two years into a project, you'll find that you have all these sort of singleton things in your test suite that you expect to just be there. It may be a solar server, it may be a Redis server, um, but you sort of expect them to be there and be trans be dedicated just to the one test that's running. If you start with parallel test, you're going to deal with those from day one. Um, and you're going you know, to spin up multiple databases. You're going to spin up, you're going to namespace your Redis keys to your test instance. Um, so when the time comes, when you actually need that parallelization, it's not going to be painful. It's just going to be some, a fact of life that you've lived with. Um, lived with for long enough that you just, it just works. This is perhaps a more controversial statement, which is to stop writing Selenium tests. Uh, I don't know how many of you out there in, in the audience use Selenium on a daily basis, but I encourage everybody to stop writing them at least by default. You don't need, for web work, you don't need Selenium tests for every feature that you're trying to deliver. You really want to start focusing on sort of what grain, granular, granularity of testing you want to be doing. If it's a feature that's only affecting the model code, don't prove that out by writing a Selenium test for when that changes. Prove that out when you, by testing the model code. Um, you really, if it's a feature that requires testing complex iframe interactions across the page with third-party providers, write a Selenium test. That's when you really need it. If it's something that tests out how your project connects JavaScript to the back end, write a Selenium test. You need that. You need that layer tested but you don't need every change in your code base tested by a Selenium test. Um, I love Sauce Labs as much as the next person, but I, it's not something you need for each test. The next piece of advice is to fix the broken test, not the broken build. I've seen most, a lot of projects that get to the point where the build breaks, and the first thing they do is go over there and hit the Build Now button. And the recent updates to Jenkins have made the Build Now button e even easier to find. But that doesn't make it any busy better to press. Um, when, the test, when the build breaks, you actually have to go and look at why it broke, um, especially if you're getting random failures. So what we've done actually on the Pivotal Tracker team is that they have a, they have a dedicated pair every day whose job it is to look when the build breaks. They're not spending all day on fixing the build, but it's the, it's the pair of the day who's actually monitoring when it goes red, looking at it, and if it's a random test failure, fixing the random test failure, actually looking at the code, what is that test trying to test, what race condition was the person not aware of, what sort of selenium detail did they not understand, and fix the test. Um, and if it's not a random failure, if it's something that's caused by a recent check-in, check in with the people who broke the build and ask them to fix it. This sort of gets you away from the larger team where everybody can ignore the red build because the real builds, you know, it goes red and it's probably not my fault, which I think a lot of people have experienced. So sort of focus on actually getting your tests reliable. And if you have broken tests um, that are just always flaky, it's better to just delete the broken tests and have a build that's red when it's red and green when it's green than one that's occasionally red and occasionally green and doesn't really mean anything. That test probably isn't valuable if it's that flaky. Another sort of tip I have is that Jenkins has an ability to annotate every build. It's got a description. You can put a description in for the build, um, which I don't know. I, it took me quite a while. Of I think I'd been using Jenkins for probably a year before I figured this out. I actually was pairing with somebody, and they went in and marked that you know the build was red because the spec that tested the payments API was red. And I, and I just sort of stared at it and wondered what they'd just done, because this text had now appeared right under the red build that let everybody on the project know exactly why that test had failed. And now this is something I do on pretty much every project. If there's a red build, and you're the one who's responsible for, or if you're the one who's taking the time to go and look at it, figure out why it failed, put a note in the build so that nobody else has to go through and read through all of the test failures and sort of get an idea of what it is. What's great about this is that 
after a week of doing this, if you're getting a red build every day or two, you'll have a really good idea by looking at the one build page why this build is failing every, every so often. Um, it lets you sort of get a summary view of what the problem is instead of just seeing, oh, well, there are occasional red builds. You can actually troubleshoot what the problem is. If you go through all this and your builds still suck, I don't have a lot of advice for you, unfortunately. CI is hard. It's something that requires constant care and maintenance and feeding, as those of us here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon all know. It's not something that just springs into existence and keeps running forever. Um, but there are some things you can do, and probably for this audience, none of these things are news. You can just upgrade to a faster instance. Amazon will sell you a very fast instance for $1,000 a month. Actually, I think now you can get SSDs, so it's probably even more than $1,000 a month. Um, it's probably not the greatest use of resources if you could go buy that box somewhere, just about anywhere other than Amazon. But it's almost always cheaper than spending a lot of engineering time to change your build. Uh, build pipelines are awesome for breaking your build up, multiple workers, of course, and fast and slow suites. This is sort of a, a fast and slow suites are something you want to hesitate before you break your test into this because what happens is you end up with a fast suite where your good tests are that you run all the time and you end up with a slow suite that no one ever looks at and goes red pretty quickly. Um, so you're pretty much deleting all of your slow tests when you do this. But there are times when it's worth deleting all of your slow tests because if they're tests that are actually stopping you from being productive and not giving you useful feedback about the changes that you're making, they're probably not terribly valuable. So if it makes you feel better, don't delete them. Move them into a slow, slow suite. If you can actually be truthful with yourself, delete the slow tests or fix the slow tests or write focus tests that actually test what that thing is trying to do. So that's sort of the end of my how to optimize your uh, your test suite, but I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Lobot and where we're going with Lobot. We've been doing a lot of work on it, and I think it's really a, an exciting set of features that we're shipping really soon here. It's actually available in pre-release on Ruby Gems. And where this comes out of is us having a growing love of Travis CI, which may not be a great thing to say to this audience, um, but um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Travis CI, Travis CI is an for the last year or so has been offering free um, continuous integration for open source projects. Um, and so they have take, they started out in the Ruby world, but they now support all sorts of runtimes. Um, and they offer a cloud hosted CI. Um, this is not going to work for the majority of the people in this room. Most of us need to keep our code behind a firewall or need to run the tests ourselves, or we have complex dependencies that aren't going to be uh, covered by a cloud provider who's trying to hit the majority of cases. It's great for people that fit in that box, but it's a fairly small box. On the other hand, Travis has dealt with a lot of the hard problems of how do I cover the majority of test cases? And so what we're doing is we're switching. We have deleted all of our chef cookbooks, aside from the ones that install Jenkins. And we're stealing all of Travis CI's chef cookbooks. So they're open source on GitHub. I talked to them on Twitter. They're totally cool with it. And so now we just have a submodule in our Ruby gems that says Travis CI Chef Cookbooks. Uh, when we've opened pull requests, they've merged them within a few hours. So they've been really cool about it. They're excited about it, I believe, or at least they're open to it. Um, and what this means is that we're what they actually give us is all sorts of chef recipes. Um, they don't just give us, at this point, they don't give us Ruby stuff, they give Java stuff, they give uh, Haskell. Um, all sorts of this is an, op is an option. We've actually, for our uses, picked out the default that we need for running a Rails app, but anyone can take this set of recipes and pick which ones they want and install those on a box. If you want, you can install all of them, but you're probably gonna be waiting for a couple hours while they all install. Um, this is exciting because it gets us to a place where we can all sort of communicate about chef recipes. And we can have a shared set as a community of people who deal with CI, have a shared place where we document how we run various servers for various services in CI. Um, so it's really, it's one CI runtime environment. You can run it on Travis or you can take it, you can run it on any Ubuntu box that you need or any Ubuntu box that you have. You can run it on your own AWS instance. You can run it behind the firewall. 
Um, so it's really a nice way to sort of leverage the community and share with people, but also have your own customizations. So Lobot has let us share our Jenkins knowledge within Pivotal for the last year and a half, but what we're really hoping is this year it lets us sort of leverage the community, share back with the community how we set up Jenkins boxes, but also get input from other people on how we could be doing things better. Currently, we sort of, we focus on the smaller use cases, but we're looking to expand into multiple build workers and, uh, you know, and build pipelines and supporting all of that kind of stuff with Chef in an automated manner so that really this stuff becomes just run this and you can configure whatever you need and there you go. So it's, it's an exciting improvement. We've shipped the pre-release version last night, in fact. Um, it works. We've used it on a project now, and we're going to be using it on all of our projects going forward. So I hope that some of you can try it out and use it and give us some feedback on how it works. As time goes on, we're going to stop being, it's going to stop being something that will only works with Rails, and it'll just be a tool that you can use for many languages as long as you have a Ruby runtime. So as I finish up here, I want to use the thank our sponsors slide, which we were all asked to have, to actually pick out some sponsors that I liked, because I didn't just want to throw up a slide that said, these are all the sponsors. So no offense to any of the other sponsors. These are ones that I've used and liked. SendGrid is awesome, because you actually get an interface of telling you why your email wasn't delivered. Confreaks is awesome, because they're great people, and they're at every conference it's worth going to. And New Relic is great because it actually lets you optimize things in your app that need optimization and not just the things that you want to optimize. So check out those sponsors along with all the other sponsors. That's all I have prepared today. So I'm hoping that you guys have some questions and I'm happy to answer them. I'm M. Coker on Twitter and the slides are online at that URL. And you're welcome to email me as well with any questions you have.